Mark Stolar, who is giving his second talk on Mark Marquez's about the API. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I learned after my first talk that in the overflow room there was no sound. So that's, well, I'm very sorry. I didn't know that, and I don't know what I could have done about it. Anyhow, so. Okay, so then we continue with modular spaces of algebraic varieties. So the last talk sort of ended by, by explaining the the, the Lee Mumford compactification of the moduli space of curves of genus 2. So now we sort of jump to the general case, and again, hopefully, this is actually somewhat familiar to, to most people. And so the objects we are, are parametrizing here, they are projective, connected, reduced curves. And then we impose a local condition on them and also a, a global condition. The local condition is that the only singularities that can happen are just nodes. So locally, analytically, they look like x, y equals 0. And there, there's a global condition that the, that the, that the dualizing sheath is ample. So sort of this will be then the general principle we try to follow in in sort of higher dimension that we impose some local conditions that said that the singularities are not too bad, and then we impose a, a global condition, which in our case will be that the dualizing sheath be ample. Now, you might ask, well, sort of, what is the dualizing sheath? And, well, if you have a smooth curve, then, then sort of that's what well, you take the tangent, but, Gen bundle and is dual, so maybe the. Uh, and th th then, if you have a plane curve, then there is a Poincare residue map says that if you look at the dualizing sheaf of P2 that has poles along C, then you restrict it to C, then you get omega C. That's, uh, that's called a junction sometime. And then if you want to so build it out of, uh, out of pieces, then the main thing that you have to remember if there is a, a reducible curve and you restrict this dualizing sheath to a smooth, uh, to a smooth irreducible component, then you, then you get not the dualizing sheath there, but you pick up some poles along the nodes. Okay, so, so that's the dualizing sheath. Okay, and so the, the, then... Now, the, 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 the question we are asking is, well, what are the correct analogs of, of smooth projective curves of genus at least two in higher dimensions, okay? And uh, then sort of with the smooth, and also what are the correct analogs also of stable curves, okay? And now it, it turns out that it that it's, uh, will be relatively easy, at least conceptually, to to answer the first part here, so what are the correct analogs of smooth projective curves? And but we have to work harder to to create a compact back moduli space, so understand then the, and the correct analogs of the stable curve, so the singular limits of our our smooth subjects. Now, so the uh, the analogs of smooth projective curves, they will be the, the, the canonical models. And so, uh, what is a canonical model? Well, let's assume that you have a smooth projective variety just sort of floating around, so you don't know, know too much about it. Now, we would like to get our hands on it by, uh, by embedding it into, in, into to some projective space. Now, but then we would like to do this embedding in some sort of natural way, that if, that if two people do, do the embeddings, they are sort of essentially the same embeddings, okay? And so, so that means that somehow we have to agree on some line bundle, bundle on this, and then pick maybe all the sections is then the easiest to do. Now, uh, there is sort of meta claim that that, on, that if you have an algebraic variety, then so the pretty much the only vector bundle you, you have on it is the tangent bundle. And then, of course, you can do various tricks with it. So, you know, sort of take direct sums, tensor products, wedge products. 
But sort of then he says that the only line bundle that you get is the, the, the determinant of the tangent bundle. Now, now we prefer the inverse of it. That is the canonical line bundle. So, no, 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 well, let me give you some evidence of, of this. And so the, maybe the first, maybe the oldest one is Franchetta's conjecture. So that says that, well, of course, if you start with some smooth projective curve, it's easy to write down lots of different line bundles. Yeah? But th th then if you vary the curve, let's assume you want to sort of pick pick just one line bundle on each curve, such that if you vary the curve holomorphically, then the line bundle also varies holomorphically. And the conjecture says that the only line bundle that does this is uh, the, the canonical line bundle, and that then, of course, it's power. So, so this was, was proved by several well, people. I think they all gave sort of different and proofs. Now, the another thing is, you know, for instance, if you start with a smooth variety, and then something like a very ample linear system, and you try to write down line bundle, bundles on the members of this linear system. And again, again you try to write down, down line bundles that, that do very holomorphically. Now then it turns out that if L is sufficiently ample, then the only thing you can do is to take a line bundle on X and restrict it to to that ample system. So maybe here x has to have dimension at least two or, or something like this to, to, do, to make sense. Uh, now, then there are also these Babylonian th tower theorems do, uh, do to Turing and, and Barth that sort of you try to go up. You sort of try to write down some vector bundle on sort of all the the PNs that extend. So vector bundle of P2 that extends to P3, that extends to P4. If you can go, go forever, then the theorem says that there's only the sums of line bundles. So oh, one, one uh, knows this, but, but, but the theorem says that that's all. There's nothing else, else, else you can do. Now, on the other hand, if, if you sort of really believe this meta claim, then, then, the, then the proof of the proof of this whole minimal model program becomes very easy because uh, well, it's a projective variety, so there's an ample line bundle, so that means that omega x is always either ample or anti-ample or zero, which is, as it's not completely true, so, so maybe sort of the right claim is that there are line bundles, but sort of the only one you can actually easily find is, is the canonical bundle. And so, well, so if we agree that's the only line bundle we can find, let's use that. And so we start with the canonical line bundle, take a sufficient the high power so that I, I sort of really have enough sections, and then I just embed the, the, the variety into whatever projective space we end up in. Okay? And now, uh, uh, then there is a CRM, which is, uh, essentially the same as the finite generation of the canonical ring, uh, which says that the image we get is, at least as a variety, it does not depend on our, 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 our choices. So we have to choose this M sufficiently divisible, so, so um, maybe you can go through some sequence like an N factorial, so to ensure it's sufficiently divisible, and you have to start sufficiently high, sort of then the image up to isomorphism uh, that, that does not uh, depend on M. And so, uh, well, for surfaces, this was, was essentially done by, by Castelnau and Enriquez, but, but in fact, so that this precise statement was only proved by Mumford, in fact. Uh, in dimension three, sort of the main idea and, and sort of the main results are due to, due to Mori, and in dimensions uh, four and up, the main work was done by Haken and, and McKernan. So uh, I suppose I should say that, that, that these are characteristic zero. Is, is so. uh, there are now, as we heard, some results in characteristic P, but, but they are still it is a low dimensions only. Okay. Uh, 
Yes. Now, um, and so now then we ask ourselves, well, uh, what is the dualizing sheep of a singular variety? And, and, and again, I mean, you can just, yeah, so actually I'm not sure it's defined in hard churn, is it? Uh, uh, no, no, it's not. So we should really sort of go, go through this. So if x is normal, yeah, then we, 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 we just take the smooth locus that uh, no, actually omega x0 there is still not defined in hard churn. Huh? What? Well, so I completely agree that for projective one, but I think for the non-projective, you don't check that it does not depend on the compactification. And so, 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 <laughs> so, 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 so I think it's not, yeah, 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 I, 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 I think, I think so, 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 the definition works, but I don't think it's proved that, that it's in the, amendment of the compactification, because there is no trace map. In the open case, there is no, no trace map to, to K. So, so, yeah, 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 there is something. Okay, and so, so uh, anyhow, but the definition works if you, you believe this, and then we just extend it to, it, to X, so then you also push it forward. So now that means that sometimes it's not a line bundle, it's just a reflexive sheave. Now, I, I think it's useful to contemplate it it's it sort of uh, interesting. Maybe you are. Maybe we are too much used to algebraic e, e geometry. That the holomorphic line bundle on on the smooth locus of a normal variety it has at most one extension as a holomorphic line bundle, but it can have infinitely many extensions as topological line bundles. So, so, so it, 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 it's sort of worthwhile to contemplate this if you are you know, riding on a bus or or something like that. Okay, so well, let's see some examples. Can we write this down, uh, down explicitly? I think so. These two examples will be actually be very good for us. If you, you have a hypersurface, then uh, in, in CN, then in fact this dualizing sheaf is free, and I can write down a generator here, or, or uh, rather I write it down a generator on sort of one chart where, where this derivative is non-zero, but in fact this completely glued to, to, to get there and they give you a, 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 a generator of that. Now the other examples that come up a lot for us at least ex examples are quotient, so CN mod a finite group may be contained in, in some of the GLN for simplicity. Now then, the, the, the quotient, the, the, then, then see, normally you would just start with, with so dx1, dxn, but if the group is not contained in a cell that this is that it's transformed by a character under the, the group action, so you have to take some, some, some so tensor, so power of it. And so then, the, 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 if you look at the quotient, that will be sort of the first example where, where, where omega itself, itself is not locally free, but a tensor power of it, or rather the, the, the double dual of a tensor power of it is locally free. So this will, will be rather the typical thing in, in these higher dimensional varieties. Uh, so now then, uh, what's the internal definition of canonical cal models? So if you have smooth varieties, then you, you, you can always pull back differential forms. If there's a differential form on the target, you can pull back. But for singular varieties, you have to, to worry about it. Maybe if you look at the previous slide, you see this suggests that you know, if you pull back, back something that has a, a denominator, you can pick up some unexpected expected poles along uh, the, the exceptional set. And indeed, uh, th 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 that happens in general, but the, but so the right class of, of singularities for us, these are the, the canonical singularities, is when the pullback actually works. Yeah? So that, that uh, I mean, it's enough to check this on you know, so one resolution 
that it, so, so if y to x is a resolution, then you try to pull back this, back this sheaf, and you, you, know, you may pick up some poles along the exceptional set, but the canonical condition is exactly that you do not pick up poles, okay? Uh, and so now we can get an internal definition of, of canonical model. It's a normal, well, projective variety. So the local condition is that, they, uh, that it has canonical singularities. And the global con condition is that the, 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 the dualizing sheaf is ample. Uh, yeah, so I think in the examples I said it, but I... I forgot to write down that when I say canonical singularity, then I always assume that, uh, that, that there is some power of the dualizing sheaf that is actually locally free. So that is actually really a, a, a very important condition and is necessary. Yeah? So, so uh, that means when I say omega x is ample, then it has a power that's actually locally free and it's ample then. Okay, now, um, so uh, Mumford's geometric invariant theory, of course, it gave an, an approach to compactify this, this uh, moduli spaces. So, so in principle, for instance, if you start just with the moduli of curves, then well, so the first thing is to check that if you embed them with a sufficiently large large uh, multiple of the canonical line bundle, uh, then you get something that is in fact, fact stable. And then if you just run the GIT machinery, that it gives you a compactification, okay? Now you may have a hard time figuring out, out uh, what it is, but you do get a, get a compactification. So, uh, Mumford did this for MG, and then then, con then computing the compactification. It, I think it was Mumford and, and Giesecker together. Now, for surfaces, Giesecker proved that, that if you start with a, a canonical surface and you take a sufficiently high embedding, then you do get something stable. But, uh, but the compactification was unclear out of the Giesecker method. And, and so at, uh, sometime later, I think, so quite a bit later, so the FIVAG VAG proved that, that you start with higher dimension uh, canonical kind of models, then you get stability, but he had to choose a non-standard line bundle. So it, 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 it was not one of, one sort of the normal line bundles that you, that you get as Hilbert and sort of Chow versions, they did not work, or this was not, not clear to work. Now, and so then, the, the, uh, for, for, for compactifications, well, sort of the bad news, news came. It was, uh, uh, it was Xu and Wang who, Wang who proved that there is the, the problem that, that, that you follow the Giesecker method, and you choose so some higher and higher embeddings, then you, you get different compactifications for wherever. So there is no stabilization. So for curves, I think if your embedding is by five times the canonical class or higher, then you, you, you get the same compactification. But Van Shu and, 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 and Wang proved that the, you know, for surfaces, you, you get different compactifications Forever, so so that's a the, that's a serious problem from this this point of view. We would like to get just one natural compact factification. Now, um, to, to be completely fair, it I think so that their work leaves open the the, the possibility that uh, the, the, there's a relatively Small choices of the polarizing line bundle actually leads to, to, to sort of the same compactification, but it's not known. So, so at, at least at the moment, it is, 
is not clear. So that means we have to, to look for some different uh, way of trying to compactify the moduli of surfaces and then the moduli of higher dimensional uh, non nickel models. Uh, and, and so the motto here is, is that, but you should keep in mind now. Uh, so, and of course, that's, that, that's one of those sort of Delphic things that, that, you know, I'm sure people like Mumford, of course, knew this, but they used the wrong translation of it. So, so and yeah, you can ask especially your Italian friends afterwards. Okay, so, so, so the, what uh, are, are we, we getting here? So, so uh, uh, there, there is this, this I, I, I get a rather simple lemma. So, uh, you know, I would like to find here one parameter compactification. So, but I, I, I imagine here that I have a, the, 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 the start with an open curve B0, compactify it to B, and I already have some nice family over B0, and then I would like to compactify this, this family. And so then I start with here, I have a family of, of canonical models, which means that if I write down the dualizing sheaf, or maybe technically it's better to use the relative dualizing sheaf, uh, then it's relatively ample, so it's ample all the fiber. And then I like this ampleness, so then I would like to write down the compact pack, pack certification where this ampleness is, is preserved, so then the relative dualizing sheaf is ample on every fiber. And then I would like this y to be not very singular, so I would like it to have canonical singularities, okay? So and I would like to emphasize that here in the open part, the fibers themselves have canonical singularities, but that implies that the total space also, that's, that's not too hard to prove. But here I would like only the total space to have canonical singularities. I don't know yet what kind of singularities I have in the fibers, okay? And so, so at least here, the uniqueness is easy to, to prove. It doesn't need any minimal model the theory, yes? So the, the, the interesting thing is that once you know minimal models, well, then, then you have actually the existence of this Y, okay? So the, so the existence of this Y, this needs minimal model theory, but the uniqueness is a very easy the computation that you have to run essentially the definition of canonical singularities on it. Okay, and so now then this gives the gives KSB, so it's called our Shepard Baron approach to the to to compactifying the the moduli of canonical models. So it says that 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 we start with a, with a flat projective family of canonical models over an open curve. Then first, just to, to take any e, e, e extension, I just want something, something projective. I don't care about the singularities, but sort of then I resolve it, okay? And then I look at the special fiber. Maybe I would like the special fiber to be also a simple normal crossing divisor, then of course I can have some multiplicities there. Now I, I, I sort of don't like multiplicities, so then I just take a base change. I, in fact, I just need that the ramification or there, or there is a multiple of all these M, MIs. Otherwise, I can can choose this completely arbitrary. So again, maybe I should emphasize that here I very much use that this characteristic zero, that, that there are no very complicated covers ramifying at a, at a point. It's a major problem here what to do in characteristic P uh, because of presence of wide ramification and, and so it is not clear, clear what to do. And now, now then I get this, this after this base change, I get this, and now the special fiber is, is now reduced, and then I just take the canonical model. And so then the compactification is not exact in my original now, now, starting family, but after this base change. Now, this is, 
is exactly, in fact, the best you can hope for. Already for curves, you, you cannot expect to, to compactify a, any family of smooth curves with something stable. There you already need some base change. So the fact that, the fact that I use a, a, a base change is, is not much. Huh? I would like to emphasize that this, this Y3 here is, of course, not smooth, but it has sort of mild enough singularities that, that for the, the point of view of the minimal model program, that's, uh, that's okay. So it is singular, but, uh, but it's okay for us. Now, if you are technically stronger than, in fact, the Mumford stable reduction theorem um, says that maybe if you they take a sort of more ramified fight cover here, then you, uh, you, you should be able to arrange this Y3 is also so smooth. But for us, this is not, not needed. Slightly singular, it's completely fine. Huh? Well, and so, so I explained to you that if you have a, 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 a projective variety, then so sort of how you take its canonical model. Take a large enough multiple of the canonical class and just all sections of it and, and so map it into to projective space. Now here, I just do sort of the relative things that you look here at the relative dualizing sheaf. You take a large enough power of it and take just all sections. You map it into projective space over C, and then sort of whatever the image is. That's the canonical model. As far as definition, that's fine. To prove that, that, that this does not depend on the choice exactly which multiple you take, that's a hard theorem. So that's haken in in, in in higher dimensions. OK, so now uh, we then I sort of have a, 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 a procedure, so how to write down one parameter limits, but you would like to know what these limits are, yeah? So, so far, it's only an existence statement. And so now, uh, we are okay here globally because, because the dualizing sheaf of omega y or other omega by over C that's relatively ample. So when I, when I restrict it to, to do the, the fiber, then, then I still have an ample dualizing thing sheaf there. It is the local condition that we have to worry about a little bit. What kind of singularities uh, do we get? Is it some reasonable class? Can we actually the, the control it? So uh, now, and again, here we should sort of, sort of, sort of focus on, on, on the local structure of the, the singularity. So, 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 so what do we have here? So we have this, have this whole family. Here's the base space. I think now I see this is Y. So here are the fibers. And then there is some possibly reducible fiber. And it has some singularities, OK? And now we know that this total space, it has canonical singularities. And so then we are saying, well, maybe that's our defining the, the property. That maybe the, the thing is that this has some singularities that has the property that if I write down a, the, the, on the smoothing of it, or just some deformation where the generic fiber has canonical singularities, that implies that the total space has canonical singularities. OK, so that's what, I, what I'm stating here. We are looking for the class of singularities that, uh, that has this property, that if I have some, say, normal variety and the Cartier divisor on it, if x minus d has canonical singularities, and this d has this unknown class of singularities, out of this I conclude that, that x has canonical singularities. Now, if d itself has canonical singularities, then it's easy to prove that x has canonical singularities. I don't even need this assumption about the, about the complement. 
but sort of, but in general, looking for this class. Now, nodes, they have exactly this property. So the node is x, y equals 0. That's not canonical. But if you deform the node, and in fact, this represents sort of all the deformations of the node, that is, all the smoothings of the node, then these are, are always is canonical. So nodes have this magic property that they are not canonical, but, but if you deform them in, them in any way, then you do get a, get a canonical total space. And you, 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 you can actually, actually check that, that, this in, that this in fact characterizes nodes. So for instance, if you have a cusp, x squared plus y cubed, and you start to deform it by adding some z to, well, so 2, 3, 4, 5 is not yet good. But if you put here 6, that is not canonical. OK? So, so we, we get this. So the cusp is, is, is not good. So that means that we are looking for sort of this magic class. And that will be our notion of semi-log canonical singularities. So let's see, can we figure out what, what semi-log canonical singularities are? And you know, they are supposed to be the higher dimensional generalizations of the nodes. So maybe the question you should ask yourself, well, what is a node? Yeah. And so, well, so how can you understand node? Well, so node I can write down easily, ax, y equals 0. Uh, and then let's try t to compute this dualizing sheaf again from, from sort of Poincare residue you formula. So on the x axis, uh, I can write down the generator. I have this formula how to write down the, the generator of the dualizing sheaf. On the x axis, I have dx over x. On the y-axis, I have dy over y. There's a minus sign here that, that is very important for some, some purposes, but for us right now, it's, it is, is not, OK? And so now, uh, then if you just stare at this, then you can end up with two characterizations of, of nodes. One is using resolution. That, well, of course, the node is easy to resolve. You just take these two lines and you just move them, them apart. So then I get really dx over x on, on one copy and, and dy over y on the other. I pick up only simple poles, OK? So then the characterization of, of, of nodes is that if I, I pull back the generating the thing, section of the dualizing sheaf, then I have at most simple poles. And again, I suggest you compute that for cusp. If you write down the generator as a pullback, you get a double pole. So, so indeed, it, the, it is something that's likely to distinguish with the nodes. Now, the, and the other thing, especially you're interested in some, uh, some differential geometry, then you might want to compute the local volume of the, of the the singularity. So you, you just have the generating section that's sigma. If you wedge it with sigma bar, then you get a two form that you can integrate. Where there's an i in, in front that's not particularly relevant, and, and you can compute this. I think, I think they probably computed in some kind of a calculus class. Uh, using sort of polar coordinates that this is infinite, but sort of barely the infinite, that if you take this form, multiply it with any the power of absolute value of x, then you get a finite integral. Okay, So uh, that means that the singularities, the, the, they have just barely infinite local volume. And now it turns out that, that uh, so, 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 so this ends up the right, right generalization. But now let's try to, to compute with this principle. So, so then uh, we have this. We sort of try to understand that there is this variety x, and inside there is this Cartier divisor d, and then I and then 
that, 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 then I would like to impose some conditions on the singularities of D that guarantees that X has canonical singularities. Okay. So the, then let's take a resolution. And so then uh, the canonical class upstairs, I can just pull back the canonical class plus something that, uh, it's that uh, the, uh, the, the, the exceptional divisors bring in. And if I pull back D, that will be just, well, this is the birational transform plus this is, is the exceptional part, okay? Now, the canonical singularities condition for exit exactly says that the J is effective. So having canonical singularity precisely means that the J is effective. Now, note that this J can have rational coefficient because it's only some multiple of the canonical class is ample. Uh, sorry, no, no, not ample, Cartier. So that means that the multiple I can pull back, but then I have to uh, divide by that, that uh, that, that coefficient. So at the beginning is, is confusing if you compute with this, but in a lecture we just don't write coefficients anyhow, so it sort of doesn't matter. Okay. Now, it uh, will be helpful to, to know that at that, 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 at least after some ramified cover along D, I can assume that every divisor in E appears with coefficient one. So this is, is actually very easy just after some, some base change. Again, it doesn't need the Mumford theorem because I sort of don't really need that sort of I be smooth, but, but it's okay. And so now once I have this, then, well, I can just write down the adjunction formula for this dy, which is a resolution of D. So if I look at ky plus dy, resic to dy, that's the canonical class of dy. And then I just write down, and that's the pullback of the canonical class plus this j minus e. Okay? And now, I would like to know that j larger or equal zero. Okay? That this j is effective. So, so now, then if I know that well, what the heck did I write here? Oh, yes, yeah. So, so now, since in E everything appears with coefficient 1, at first seems that J larger or equal 0 is equivalent to this J minus E resting to dy larger or equal, well, minus 1, okay? So you see now, this is precisely the condition. So this is the canonical class of D. And this is the canonical class of dy. And if here I get something minus 1, that exactly means that the pullback picks up a simple pole, which exactly happened for the node, OK? So, so that the j minus c larger equal minus 1, that exactly says that I pick up at most simple pole, OK? And so now it's nice when I just add the knee. Well, so hopefully this larger equal minus 1, means every coefficient of this minus 1, that implies that j larger equals 0. But it sounds very promising until you, you, you realize that you know, the vast majority of exceptional divisors does not meet dy at all. Yeah? If you just resolve, if you keep on resolving, you get a large number of exceptional divisors that does not intersect sect, uh, d d dy at all. Now, but it turns out, and so sort of that was actually Shakurov's conjecture that, that sort of this doesn't matter, this equivalence is in fact, in fact true, uh, but, uh, but it needed substantial work. So there was a weak form, I proved it some time ago. I think sort of the precise statement I need, it was done by by Kravakita, and in, so, I mean, general, there are some very interesting convexity the properties of the coefficients of, of this J that, that in, imply this. Okay, and so, so uh, now, now the base of this, so knowing what the nodes are and the computations on this, this previous slide, now we can uh, we can understand these semi log canonical singularities. And so there are, there are two, two, two ways of, 
of, of characterizing them. So one is using resolutions, that I take some resolution and let E denote uh, the, the, the reduce the exceptional divisors. Then the condition is that if, I, that if I pull back the R's power of omega, then I pick up at most R fold poles. So that's, that's really the same as pull back omega, then I get at most simple poles. But you see, since here I have to take the W dual of the tensor power, if I get simple poles for, for, for omega, and omega is not locally free, that is not enough to imply that, for instance, for omega square, I get at most most two-fold poles. But it's enough to check this for one case where this is locally free. So sort of in, in practice, I just have to take a high enough power that is, is, is locally free. Then I get simple poles. Now then, there's other characterization you, using the local volumes that I had, that if I just take a generator of, of this omega, now again, this is not locally free, but if I take a high enough power or suitable power, that's something, something locally free. So that means, you know, when I write this sigma because of this, it's only determined up to a root of unity. But luckily, when I look at sigma wedge, sigma bar, this root of unity actually goes away. So, 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 so even though sigma is not well defined, sigma wedge, sigma bar is is well defined, and now this can end up infinity just as for nodes, but as soon as I multiply it, it with some, some, so, some function that vanishes along the singular set, it is, is finite. There is a power of i in it that, I, that I'm always confused about it. So, so maybe you should just have an absolute value here. That's probably the easiest to, 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 to take care of it. So, so, and indeed, it, it turns out that, that, that so these conditions are equivalent, and they, in, in fact, characterize the semi-canonical singularities that we want. Now, maybe I should say that so I suppose usually you, are, you have been more likely to hear about log canonical case. And so the log canonical is just the normal case of of semi log canonical. But we know that as for, for curves in the limit, we get typically reducible curves. So that means the same thing happens in higher dimension, that frequently these limits, uh, they, they, they have several uh, components. So, so that means that we have to deal with the non normal case of these, these singularities. OK, well, let's see. See some examples of the of the singularities we had. Well, uh, in dimension two, one can get complete lists. So the, the canonical is the same as either smooth or Duval singularities. Here are just some some well sort of some of the Duval singularities. The, but I haven't defined the log terminal. It's it's when that integral sigma wedge sigma bar is actually finite. That's, that's, uh, that, that is equivalent to, to, to log terminal. And so frequently, that is much nicer than the, than the, the general case. So the, the, these are the quotient singularities. They are, are a nice example here. And in higher dimension, I just want to write down some examples. So, so we do not have a structure theory. There's a reasonably good theory in dimension three, mostly due to Miles Reed. But, but, but uh, yeah, I think starting with dimension four, there are lots of actually fairly complicated the examples. But I just want to write down that if you take the cone over where some variety, then it's semi log canonical if and only if x is semi log canonical. And, and it is Fano, so minus canonical. Well, class is a multiple of h, and this r is larger or equal to 0. Again, this r can be rational. And the cone is canonical if x has canonical singularities, and this r is at least 1. Okay? So, so for instance, if you start with a, with a smooth funnel under its anti-canonical embedding, then the cone over it is canonical. But if you take a multiple of the anti-canonical class, then it will not be canonical, 
but it will be actually even log terminal. Okay, so these are some examples. And so now then the same as for stable curves, we had a local and the global condition. Again, here we have this condition, the local condition that it should have only semi-local singularities. And the global condition is the omega x b ample. Now, uh, so, and then I answer to the next question, which uh, in fact, sort of for some time, it did not cross people's mind to ask this question. So what are stable families? Because, you know, for a family of stable curves is just a flat family of curves where the fibers are, are stable curves. But it turns out to be that this is the wrong answer in, in higher dimensions. Already for surfaces, this is the so, so obvious answer is not the right one. Okay? So let me see if I can give you some nice example illustrating it. I start with a family of, of, of varieties, and I try to write down an example that, that, that sort of David Eisenbahn would really like. And so that I start with some family. It's a two-parameter family. They sit inside side, uh, P5. The condition is the, 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 the rank of this matrix be at most one. Okay? And now uh, we claim that, the, that, that so that I look at, the, at the, the fiber, and I say that the that the fiber has semi canonical singularities. In, in fact, in this case, it is, it, it is KLT. The fibers are all, all non-normal, so it's much nicer. If and only if three times the canonical class of, of the fiber is Cartier, it's, it's completely fine so far. But here comes the bad news that either S and T are both zero or S and T are both non-zero. So that means that, so that here I am in my plane, and, uh, and, and uh, there is some bad locus here. Yeah? And, uh, so the origin is OK, but I have to, but I have to leave out sort of these, these lines. OK, so, so the, now the, then if I look at this torus, Union the origin, well, this is not an algebraic variety. Well, it's a constructible set, but it's not an algebraic variety. Yeah? And then you say that, that, well, so for instance, if I take this you know, slanted line here, then the, 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 and he, he, the fibers are always these uh, canonical models, but if I deform it just a little bit, I pick up. Pick up two bad points, so so this this sounds actually pretty bad to start with. But let's let's sort of check check these claims first. So, but uh, what happens o o on the open set? Well, the S and T are non-zero, so I can as well just pretend that this is S X four and this is X five. So that means I just look at the look at the set where this matrix has matrix has rank at most one, and well, that's of course just P1 cross P2. So that's even then smooth, okay? So that's, that's completely fine. The singularities are not bad. Now when S and T, they are both zero, then, then, I, get, then I get this determinantal varieties. Now you see, so if you just look at this, then you say that uh, I, I just defined the degree three rational normal curve in P3. And now, since I have two variables uh, was missing, that says I have to take the cone over it twice. Yeah? So if I take the cone over it right first, uh, then I get the quotient singularity C2 quotiented out by the Z3 action, which acts on the two coordinates with the same weight, and then when I have the second cone, I just lo 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 locally just take this and so product with C. So that means the singularities are, 
are essentially just this quotient singularities. And so, uh, so that's again completely nice for us. Now, I think sort of this is maybe the least known, but, but, but you can, can figure out that this is in fact the cone over the root surface F1. One. So you have the root surface F1 inside P4 degree, degree 4, I believe, and then you take the cone over it. Now, you might still hope that this is okay because F1 is a del pezzo surface. But this is not the anti-canonical embedding. The canonical class here is not proportional to the hyperplane class. So that means that, the, that it, when I take the, take the cone, then the singularity over it is not semi-canonical. In fact, the canonical class, I get there, no multiple of it, 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 it is Cartier. Okay, so so sort of is this example just at the end of everything, and now I I do not remember these numbers, but but it it uh, it turns out that the open set and the point they should be different families. If you compute the self intersection of the canonical class, then you get different numbers. So, so here, and so the order, the complement, you compute this self-intersection, they are different and numbers. Now, you might say that the previous example, the ampleness of K, of course, was wrong. In fact, these sort of the Fano varieties when, when this makes sense. But it's very easy to, to produce an example out of this where the canonical class behaves this way. And so, so the, the, then again, it's, a, it's a, a computation. I did not write down the, the numbers, but, but if you compute the self-intersection of the canonical class in these three cases in the open set along the lines and the origin, uh, then you're getting three different values. And now, of course, that's sort of in a reasonable family, we would like at least the self-intersection of, can, of the canonical class constant. So, so that that's, that's somehow just our degree. And so, but there is a CRM, so let's see that we try to then impose the condition that somehow uh, the self-intersection of the canonical class is, is, is constant, and turns out that, that uh, with this it works very nicely. So if, if I just start with a, with a flat projective morphism whose fibers are stable, actually S reduced is not important here at all. Anyhow. And so, uh, yes, it is. It is. Sorry. So, sorry. It is, in fact, very important. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So uh, it, 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 it's not important for one and two, but of course, clearly for the three, it's important. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, if it's a reasonable family, then we would like at least, the, at least this degree, which is frequently called the volume of the fibers, we would like this to be, to be locally constant. And now, one claim is, and this is just, just sort of pure luck, that in, that in fact, just this being constant is the same as all the plurigenera uh, b b being in locally constant. You know, if you think of this as a Hilbert Barrett function as m varies, then this just tells you that essentially the leading coefficient of this Hilbert function is not changing under the deformation. But this theorem says that once the leading coefficient is not changing in the deformation, then all the other coefficients are also so constant. And now, in some sense, this is the real winner because this is a completely local condition that if you look at the relative dualizing sheet and its m's power, then it's flat and commutes uh, with, uh, with, with its base change. Now, you see, this is a condition that makes perfect sense over an arbitrary base. 
So that means that this will be our defining condition that if we have a now over an arbitrary base, we have a flat projective morphism with stable fibers, then, then, then this is a stable family if and only if this condition holds. Okay? So at least we have a definition now. And now let's see if this gives us some reasonable moduli theory. Well, yeah, so I think so that this is the definition that I have been, been through. So this will be the definition of, of, of stable of families. And now, well, uh, one thing that you have to, to, to prove there, that this is a reasonable uh, condition. OK, so it says, let's start with an arbitrary flat family of projective varieties. And I, 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 I just make some very weak assumptions. So the, the, so the morphism itself should have pure relative dimension n, and, uh, and sort of that the fibers have at, at worst nodes in, in co-dimension one. So if I, have, if, 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 if I have a family of curves, then, then it's the same as assuming that the fibers themselves, themselves have only nodes. But in higher di dimension, I just assume something about the co-dimension one locus of the singularities. And then the, the, uh, the, and the statement that comes out that the stable uh, pullbacks of this family day are representable. So that means that there's a monomorphism here, here such that for an arbitrary morphism, the pullback is a stable family if and only if G factors uh, through, through this. Okay, so that means at least in this relative setting so that this is then the object that that parameterizes the stable or morphism and so that means so that in this example this this uh, stable object is I have to take the open locus and then I had to take the disjoint union of it with this point so I don't try to put the point in here I put the point in front just as a disjoint joint Union and so that that means that if you restrict it it to this line, then all the fibers are stable, but the family itself is not stable because you cannot factor it through with this disjoint joint point point sticking out. Huh? And so. So, um, so, so, so one big, big, big uh, problem is that, so, 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 I, I, I conjecture that my definition works in characteristic P as well, but for instance, even over curves. I don't know how to show that this is invariant under base change. So if I have a widely ramified fide, fide base change, I, I don't know how to, to prove that my notion is independent of that. So, so it's, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know whether that's the only problem that exists, but somehow at the very basic level, there are some. Some sort of. uh, well, finite type. I mean, uh, well, well. So, so it, it, it's sort of it's a monomorphism in the growth ending sense. So. So, so that the semi-normalization is not a uh, uh, monomorphism because an RT scheme, scheme uh, might have different liftings. So, so yeah, let's see. So it says that, yeah, I think Kotain says that for any morphism, 
yeah, yeah. The thing you get an injection for, for any thing mapping to stable mapping there, that's an injection. So yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. And so so now we have the 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 at least sort of the basic the definition. So these are 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 families and then then there's a main existence since CRM. So if you fix fix N and D, then you would like to to g get a projective course moduli space for for stable varieties of dimension N where the self intersection of the canonical class is D. And uh, and uh, main theorem of this that these exactly exist, so there is there is no problem with that. And the moduli properties are just as good as for MG bar, but as a scheme it might be very complicated. Again, I emphasize that, that this is a characteristic zero statement at the, the moment, though there are some the, the, there is nice progress for surfaces in characteristic P, but it's not not so fully really complete yet. So, so maybe I just want to run through sort of the main contributions, and then I I stop, and then I will prove a few of these things things next time. So, 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 so for surfaces, uh, well, since we have to deal with sort of one parameter families of surfaces, they have dimension three. So this uh, needed the three-dimensional MMP, so it had to wait for, for more. Now the existence was in my work with Shepard Baron. Now, then it turns out that in our case, it's actually the, to prove that it's finite type, so that there are finitely many irreducible components, that has been a, a very difficult problem. For surfaces, it was proved by Alex Sayev, and then the projectivity, the I did that. So in fact, it's easy to, to, to prove, or it's relatively easy to, to prove that irreducible com, components themselves are, are, are projective, or maybe, yeah. And so, so then, yeah. And now, the, 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 uh, then the local structure of these spaces can be arbitrarily bad. These are examples of, of Bakir. Now, higher dimension, we need the higher dimensional MMP is, uh, especially the contributions of Haken, McKernan, and, and Shu. So in, there are lots of, of, of places here where we need the, the MMP. The, the existence is sort of pretty much the same as, as well, no, maybe it's an overstatement. Anyhow, then the, the, the finite type is, again, in a weaker version by, by Karu, the stronger version, Haken. McCurn and Shu, and then the proof of, of the projectivity, again, it required some new ideas. Uh, it, it, it was by Fujino, and then a general case by Kovac and, 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 and Patakfalvi. So, uh, okay, thank you. The, the relative dualizing sheaf, yes. And so, 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 and so what is the relative dualizing sheaf? Well, the relative dualizing sheaf is, is, is okay. So, so, add, add, so in, 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 in fact, you see here, here, so, uh, so, so the, 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 the sort of stable, of varieties, so there's a dense open set, but sort of then again in co-dimension one it has only nodes, yeah. So that means that if I leave out a co-dimension two set, then I just have Gorenz 
Steen fibers, and the, 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 then I have a flat morphism with Gorenstein fibers. And so the relative dualizing sheaf on that is, is no problem. I mean, it is locally free, and then I just take the powers and then just push it forward. Yes, 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 yes. It is so. I think as long as it's a Gorenstein morphism, it is, it's, it's fine, and then I have to push forward. Yeah. Yeah. Just a question about terminology. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, and so, well, I think you should have asked this from Mumford, who defines stable curves to be on the boundary, yeah? So I, 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 I try to follow this Mumford definition. That, uh, and so, well, yeah, okay. I, so, uh, yeah, I mean, stable is a bit o overused. So, you know, there are a lot of things that are, are both stable. I don't know. Maybe we should start inventing new words all the time. Yeah. You could ask how your, how your stability number compared to the uh, Wong Chu example, the Vermokas, where their you know, TXC stability is your stability. Uh, yes, okay. So, so um, the. Uh, let's see, let's see. Um, let's see. What was it? So, um, and so, so, you know, so, so if, if, if you look at Mumford's for GIT, uh, then it gives you a, a, a little. Uh, limit, and I believe what what they prove is that that uh, that if this this limit is independent of the embedding, so the if and only if if the GIT limit is the same as the Kohler Shepard Baron limit, yeah. and so the word imam for um, that 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 so some of the semi-stable. That's some semi log canonical singularities, they will not occur on his GIT limits. I mean, he was talking about elliptic singularities and rational surface singularities. Yeah, but so, so, so they just agree only when, you know, all sort of the smallest possible set where they could agree. So it's it, 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 yeah, it's a rather strange situation. 